Okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you for virtually coming. So this is an introduction to data analysis using Python. So essentially our main topic will be Python. However, I will be covering multiple topics as well that can aid you. Um, and mainly creating either a report or a journal. So essentially creating plots that you can put in a journal or if you want to do a publication or just in mass quantity, this is kind of the course for you. So again, you probably all know my email by now. The everything in this class will be via GitHub. So essentially, I believe you cannot really see right here that I published, I mean, I put the first lecture right here. So the first lecture is right here in, on GitHub, and so is the syllabus. Uh, the main reason uh, we'll use GitHub as kind of our uh, database for code and notebooks is because we'll also be using GitHub as well. So a little bit in the future we'll be using Git, and so you guys will be maybe pushing something into this um, GitHub as well. Not in this branch, but in another branch. I'll explain that more in detail later on. Um, so. Again, I mean, this is not actually a class, but just to be formal, like if you guys have any questions later on with more explanation, just you know, send me an email and we can talk and I can explain to you something if you don't feel comfortable with just me explaining it during the lecture. And I believe class hours right now are from Tuesday to Thursday, 12 to 1. That's tentative, so if, like, if you find this hour is not as convenient as we originally thought, I can adjust it to everybody's needs. but. As for now, I believe this is the most adequate hour. So again, the course description, so I can explain it. So our main focus will be in uh, Pandas libraries, like, um, sorry, Python library. So that includes Pandas, NumPy, SymPy, Matplotlib, and Plotly. However, I will be teaching you all a couple of free and open source tools. So that will include, first of all, Jupyter Notebook right now. And then um, VS Code, VS Codium, so this is kind of a, a coding editor software. So this is very useful as well. So like sometimes you need to modify code. This is a very efficient way of doing it. Then I'll also introduce a little bit of LaTeX, not too much, but just like, okay, if I have a paper, how do I include plots? How do I do like basic stuff like including an equation or enumerating a list? That's kind of like the basic things we'll do. And then one of the more important things I'll teach you is how to use Git and GitHub. So essentially, Git itself is just a software. So GitHub isn't the one that created Git. Um, you could use GitLab, you could use Bitbucket, or you, if you're very creative and you have resources, you can create your own Git um, hosting site. So essentially, the only thing GitHub does it hosts the code for you. However, you can just use your Git on a computer without any any um, online software. However, it's ideal when you do push it to GitHub since the another big thing about Git is um, collaborative work. So I'll get that more into detail. But essentially, uh, well, I don't want you to think that GitHub and Git are just kind of a Google Drive for code where you can just push your code into. The Git's a lot more. You'll learn more about how you can use it for version control and for collaborative efforts and I'll explain more of what that means in those lectures. Then I'll also go over vector images. So this is very important when you want to do, let's say, um, any professional paper, like let's say if you want to put something in Nature or IEEE. It's very nice if you use vector images since those will look very nice in PDFs. I'll explain more what a vector image is and why that is preferred. And also go over a little bit with about Inkscape, which is a great way to convert images that aren't even vectors. So if you have a later rasterized images, you can convert those into vector images and I'll explain more in detail in those lectures as well. So our our talks will include functions which are super important. They may seem may seem like a simple concept, but once you get into more elaborate functions, you'll see the how useful they are. Obviously, data frames will be like 50% of this course since you know data frames will be the way we interface with data in general, like especially or the way we'll do is with pandas. 
essentially once we have like let's say a large CSV or Excel file, you'll be able to manipulate the data very easily with data frames. Uh, title generation. This is very, very useful, but also very understated. It kind of just seems like relatively simple, and it is. However, this will save so much time when you create plots, since after you generate a plot, you don't want to waste so much time just creating a title. So this will kind of let you create a, for, uh, what's called, a specific format for a title with relative ease, and you can create multiple titles at once. So let's say if you need to plot 20, 30, 50 plots, this will help you a lot. Timestamp manipulation, so at least for our work, this can be very useful for us power engineers since everything has a timestamp. So knowing how to plot with time and understanding how to interface with time, the timestamp data type is very useful. Then we'll go over a little bit with Nubby math. So essentially how you can do like, not basic math, but a little more elaborate math with Nubby. So even uh, Pandas is kind of based on the Nubby library and you can do very cool things with Nubby. Like one example would be like doing the fast forward transform of a certain column of a data frame. That might be one reason to use Nubby. Then matrix algebra. So let's say if you want to work with matrices in Python, it's actually very simple to use. There's two libraries that do it. It's one of them is Simpy, which actually might be easier if you're just gonna um, work with matrices alone. So it's kind of uh, the math out computation for Python. And then the other one would be um, Nubby itself. And so Nubby they're treated as 2D arrays. I'll get more into detail about that when I get into that lecture. And then obviously another very cool thing about this class will be static and interactive plotting. So essentially we're going to create, like I said, very uh, high quality vector image plots, which are the static ones for like paper. However, another thing will be uh, cool here will be interactive plots. Like, so I like, you, think you, some of you guys seen this before, there are plots I will do in HTML. So you just open a web browser and you can actually uh, zoom in on the plot or you can do multiple things with that plot with no additional software once it's generated. Um, so does anybody have any questions until now? Okay, so for required materials, well, um, so essentially uh, you can, we're going to use Python 3. Please do not use Python 2, it'll just make everything much more complicated. Also, uh, Python 2 has just been depreciated this year, which means you're not going to maintain it anymore, so you should try to avoid Python 2 as much as possible. Um, I recommend an Anaconda Navigator, but again, you can, if you want to use another IDE, if you want to use Spider, if you want to use a Google Colab, you're free to use those as well. You're going to need to install the Plotly library, so there's more instructions here on this link. And then we're going to need to use Git. So essentially, I will teach Git mainly for the, with the terminal, and it's important that you know how to do it. However, maybe later on, once you understand it, a Git GUI might make it easier, so that way you're not trying to memorize the exact syntax of a, the command line, but you should just know what, like, okay, I know how to push, I know how to pull, I know how to merge, I know how to create a branch. Those are important things to know when you are using Git. Um, then I'll also go over LaTeX a little bit. Not too much. I'm not going to teach you like, very elaborate this is not a LaTeX course, so this will just be more like how to do some basic things with LaTeX, like how do I add some symbols, or how do I, you know, j uh, create a relatively complex equation, or how do I do like a simple table or a simple, uh, let's say, you know, to call them uh, bullet points and lots of stuff that might be useful for um, a paper. And then the most important part is how do I actually import. Um, how do I import and work with a template? Like let's say for IEEE or Nature, they have their templates. So mostly you don't have to do most uh, most of the work, but I will teach you how to interface with those, which actually might be more useful in the end, since you're not going to really create LaTeX documents from scratch. You mostly will just import a template and just need to learn how to interface with that. And one of the more important things I want to emphasize in this course will be how do I import figures for those uh, for a LaTeX document? Um, then, so I, LaTeX is just kind of the software 
that runs like so it's kind of like you can think of it as like let's say python python is just a language and then we're going to work with anaconda so that's kind of more of like the ide like the place where you actually code it's kind of like the gui so that's the same thing with text studio text studio like so text live or mictech are two um implementations of latex you're free to use either one there really isn't an advantage of one over the other so whichever one you find easier to install or use feel free to do so there's there's really no difference and then basically those will um, like text will interface with those so essentially you only really see these um, latex um, implementations you'll just see it via text studio which will be how we're going to look at everything and then VS Code, VS Codium, it's very useful for it. Sometimes Anaconda Navigator is a pretty good IDE, but if you want to do some manipulations with code or just want to write a simple Python script, it, these might be very useful um, coding softwares. And then this one isn't too important, but I will maybe go maybe like 20, 30 minutes over it, but it might be useful just to have. So Inkscape is really, Inkscape is really useful for um, vector images. So that's not that complicated and you can kind of think of it as, as a very nice version of paint but let's say if you want to create figures like that you want to draw for your I don't know for your like say your paper this would be a good software or let's say you already have some figures and like let's say you have a PNG it's kind of small and then when you try to zoom up when you try to let's say amplify it it kind of looks ugly or kind of looks um, pixelated Inkscape, you can actually convert that rasterized image into a vector image, and that might help with um, what's called publications. So I'll get more into detail with that later on. So this is kind of the material we'll need. Um, so of course, objectives was just learn Python syntax. So essentially, just people say, "Oh, Python is really easy; you can learn it in a day." I actually really disagree with that statement. Yes, I mean, if you, like, the Python syntax is relatively easy to learn. We, we're literally going to go over that today. However, Python is just much more than like, the, it's just like, it's if you're just able to bare bones Python, yeah, it's a relatively simple language and there's not, not too much um, science to it. However, if you actually learn about the magic of Python, actually, better phrase, is its libraries. Python itself is just like C or any other language. Well, technically, Python's an interpreter, so um, it's a higher level language. The magic of Python is RS library. So, let's say if you want to use Numpy or Pandas, those aren't native to Python. You have to import those. And so, essentially, what they are, they're just a package of functions that you already made. So, the I think the goal with Python is to code the, le um, the least amount of possible. So, you don't want to what's called reinvent the wheel. You just want to have stuff that's ready, um, already made and you just kind of want to interface with it. So that's kind of the point. So I mean, just learning how to how Python works, it's useful since once you import those libraries, it, it's a uh, less of a learning curve. It's like, let's say, I need to learn an entirely new software and, and its syntax. That's the kind of, I think, one of the reasons people create libraries for Python since its syntax is relatively simple to use. If you, um, once you know the its syntax, once you get new libraries, you just, you're okay, yeah. So how do you how do you use this function? Now you're good to go. Now you learn the new skill. So that's I think the magic of Python. It might not make sense right now what I'm saying, but once we get into Japan, as we get into Nambi, we get into Blockly, you'll understand what I'm, what I'm saying right now. Um, understand what a data frame is. So essentially, this is basically pandas. It everything's with a data frame. So it's a new type of um, I don't want to say variable, but like just kind of like a new format to work with. So essentially, like how we have vectors, how we have uh, integers, how we have float numbers, how we have strings. A data frame is like a very complex 2D array. However, that's a very simplistic way of explaining it. And you'll see what you can do with data frames is amazing, which kind of comes to the third point to clean and manipulate data using the data and this data frame. So essentially, once we're done with this course, hopefully you can just get a CSV or an Excel sheet or data from the internet. You can easily clean it, manipulate the data to your needs. Like let's say, I want the max for every day, or I want to plot data only from six to nine from every day for a year. 
that should be easy with pandas. That's kind of the point of like stuff that would be normally what's it called physically intensive in the sense of like oh I need to do that manually would be a nightmare. Pandas makes that easy. Then how the, the basic understands of the Nupi library, I think I kind of went into that. So then uh, here's another important thing, like learn how to implement Nupi math on a data, Pandas data frame. So that's the main reason I'll explain Nupi math for you is, so I mean, we know like just with Pandas, you can like add, subtract, do multiple things. But with Nupi, you can do a lot more advanced algorithms with Nupi. Then use Nupi and Simpy for matrix algebra. So it's kind of like a, not exactly, of course, but it's kind of useful just to know how to work with matrices in Python, and it actually might be useful for pandas as well. Uh, and then understand the concept of vector images, so I think I went into that. Understand the concept of get and version control, so I went into that as well. So now learn how to collaborate with git. So another important thing is like not only how to do like, okay, I can get push, I can get uh, pull, so like putting things into like a repo, but okay, how can I check my progress and how do I let's say work with somebody else and okay I'm going to do this part uh, he's going to do this part she's going to do this part how do you merge all those codes together so that's kind of the, the goal so like everybody can kind of do their own part with github and git and then just do the basic a uh, basic plot and plotly again I probably will never shut up about how amazing plotly is uh, I'm warning you right now because plotly is an amazing uh, library for python actually if just as a side note, we can use Plotly as well in um, MATLAB, you can use it in R, I believe there's like another language I'm forgetting, but yeah, Plotly is an API, so essentially it has a really good library for Python, however you can use it with other languages as well, however uh, in this class we'll just be using uh, it for Python, but you'll see the amazing things you can do with Plotly, like you really have to think less about creating plots, it's just everything is just streamlined and it's just beautiful how it just spits it out so and then I'll generate auto generate titles for plots so essentially we're going to like just get titles and just put them into a plotly function it'll just spit out the titles for us so there's less manual labor in creating plots essentially we're never going to actually make a plot per se we're just going to describe of how what we want it to do and it'll do it for us. That's kind of the goal with iPhone and Plotly. So then create elaborate plots that contain multiple data sets. So at first you're just gonna do like a simple let's say X versus Y graph, but what if you wanna include two graphs, what if you wanna have different values or let's say what if you want to do a 3D graph, like we'll go into that as well. And then we're going to have to use functions and for loop to streamline the production of plots. So essentially, um, my goal for you is to only learn how to do a plot once, make it into a function, and then you just kind of run a function with a for loop. So essentially, it'll just spit out plots one after another with relative ease. And then use high quality plots and LaTeX to create journal worthy papers and high quality reports. So essentially, we'll learn how to use our plotting capabilities and LaTeX to create a paper. I'm not going to teach you how to, let's say, how to write a paper in a sense of like context. However, the actual format I will be teach you how to be very particular and very, very, very picky with making one of those. So it's very high quality. Since I, I think I spend way too much time um, going up, uh, with LaTeX and um, Plotly just to learn how to do that. Since I, I really enjoy it. I think some of these nature papers are read, but. One of the things I just loved was just how they presented um, information in such a beautiful way. And even though that's not the main point of a paper, it's something very enjoyable, at least for me. And then, last, um, um, last of all, learn how to have fun with data science and plotting. So, essentially, the idea with this entire course is to take that tedious um, uh, aspect of data science and plotting. Because like I think all of you have right um, in this course have probably plotted data before, and it's probably been a nightmare sometimes since you have a lot of data to look at, manipulate, and it may not be fun. Uh, hopefully, with this course, you actually have fun in manipulating and plotting data. At first, I hated plotting data, but once I learned how to actually 
do it in a streamlined manner I actually go online now and find like information like say COVID or population and I actually start doing plots myself just for fun since now I know how to actually get data from like multiple sources and I can do plots the way I like them and it's and I can do that with ease so that's a very cool thing to do um does anybody have any questions so far Okay, so we'll start now with Python. So, so I'll just first explain Jupyter Notebook real quickly. So, if anybody has any questions on installing this, please let me know. So I'll just go. If, okay, I'm launching a Jupyter Notebook. So in my case, I have in this Git code folder, Introduction to Data Analysis, Lecture One, and then I'm just gonna open this. So IPYMB. It's basically the an IPython notebook. So a Jupyter notebook, it started its life as a IPython, so it just which basically means interactive Python. So I just kind of click on this, and now I just open that. So essentially, you can download this, save it into a folder, and then you can just use this like file system from Jupyter to open the notebook. Okay, so this. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so. Uh, when I use uh, Jupyter Notebook, it always uh, kind of like uh, opens in a specific folder and uh, I have to save in that specific folder. But is there any way that uh, I can uh, save uh, these things like uh, in specific uh, folder I want to use or open the files from a specific folder that I want to uh, get the data from? Okay, good question. So actually when I started using Jupyter like a year ago, I would just save everything in the, like, I believe in this case it would just be like the general file, so like let's say I open here, it just goes to your main file, so like let's say in this case this is my main one, like documents, downloads, get code, so if you just press new right now, in Python yeah. 3, I'll save it here, but like let's say I want to save it, let's say, I don't know, in documents, you can go into documents and then you press new, and it'll save it in documents. Let's say I want to save it in uh, like a specific folder that I created in E Drive. How e do I do that? E Drive. Okay. So I do believe that there is a limit. So I'm actually trying to figure it out myself. Like I do know, like let's say everything in your C Drive is uh, fair game, but like let's say if you want to do in your E Drive, that's a good question. I will get back to it. However, like, what I'm trying to say though is like, let's say, you should be able to like, say, let's say in documents and create your own folder. Uh, I think, I do believe Python does have a problem, like, let's say if you want to save it, like, let's say in Locker. Uh, there are some uh, difficulties with that, I'm actually trying to figure that out myself. But if you, like, let's say you want to save it in documents, uh, you can do new Python 3 and I'll save it there. Um, I just kind of freshly installed Linux on this computer, and so like, let's say, uh, like documents, I'm going to create a new folder. Um, so let's say, I don't know, my code, and I create here, and then like let's say, I'm going to create another folder, and I'll call this one, I don't know, um, July code. So like let's say I create some folder for my July code. So I go back here, I go on documents, then you see here there's another folder, my code. I click on my code. And let's say I want to save it in July code. Then all you do again, just press new and then Python 3. And then you should be able to, like, once you save it, it should save there. Yeah, but it's, it's still kind of limiting my uh, options where I can save my files. So, yeah. Yeah, so another thing you can do is so I know this for Linux, I would have to see how they do it with Windows since uh, at least. The way I do is I, I launch it from the terminal. So right now it shows me all my folders here. Since I um, since this is just basically, right now when I open the terminal it goes here, right? Like let's say I want to save it in op, which is just kind of a new uh, so cd slash, I believe, it's, I believe it's slash opt. I'm not wrong. Okay, so then in this case I launch Jupyter dash notebook. If you notice, now there's only one folder here. This is SageMath. 
So in this folder, it's you can actually even exit here, um, access it from here. So like slash off. So this is where you can kind of save some other folders. So in this case, I installed uh, Stage Map, which is like another map program I have. So instead of going to my home file, it now went to that op one since I changed uh, where I'm launching it from. Uh, with Windows, I know you clicked on Jupyter Notebook and it just kind of opens, I believe, in C drive. So I would have to look at how to do that, look that up for Windows. But I do know with if you can just open it somehow a terminal and say Jupyter Notebook, like wherever you, um, wherever you're adding that file system, will open from there. So like right now, I'm opening just from my main drive. Well, let's say there's an E drive, if you can somehow change your directory to the E drive and then launch Jupyter Notebook, then you should be able to do it. So, I don't have an E drive on this OS, but like, let's say if I were on Windows, I would have to check, but I will let you know, like, next lecture how to do it. Does that kind of answer your question, or...? Yeah, uh, I think so. Okay. Okay. So, uh, any more other questions about Jupyter Notebook or how to open um, files or anything? Okay, so I'll have this split into two parts. So this first part I kind of just got from um, just another source, I believe it's just like from the Python documentation. So this is just kind of the basics, uh, very very basic part of Python and then I'll, my part will be mostly the functions and arrays. Okay, so let, let us begin. So I guess the first thing we can uh, go over is just the uh, comments. So when you have like just a number sign, hashtag, whatever you want to call the symbol, and anything after that line will be a comment. So you can just put a comment over any code or let's say you put some code right here and then you put a comment then like, it'll just ignore everything after that symbol. And then like here, like if you put obviously the, the, the number sign inside of the quotes, it will just, you know, print it out as, a, as just a number sign. So yeah, so and if you want to like say we use a number sign, just put inside quotes and understand that it's a number sign and not a comment. So then now some basic uh, data types. So, if you guys ever came from a C background, you know you have to define your variables like char or I'm actually forgetting the I think int, float, double. Um, I believe if it's like C plus plus, you can use like arrays, like and like strings as well. So with Python, we don't do that. We just kind of, um, that's where it becomes an interpreter. So if it's a, if you put a two, it's gonna figure out, okay, yeah, I believe this is a number, so I'll assign this as a number. Or like, let's say if you start writing a, like a string, it'll be like, okay, like I see a, an array of letters, so I'll just um, assign this as a string. And that's actually the part that actually literally not slows down Python the most. Uh, since you, there is no um, formal definition for the variables at first, that's why it's a slightly slower. However, if you actually fix that, uh, that you can actually create into something called Cypho, and I'll explain that later. However, like right now, what it's nice about it is like, okay, I'm going to create a variable. You just say 2 and it knows it's a number. You create 2.0, it knows it's a float. So there's no thinking about like what the data type is. So that's the a nice thing about Python. So like let's say t plus two equals four. Uh, Fifty minus five times six. So obviously um, um, Python follows the order of operation. So five times six is thirty. Fifty minus thirty should be twenty. And we get twenty. Now we get that twenty and you can divide it by four and you get five point oh. So this is just now I change it automatically changed the data type into a float. Then we have eight divided by five, you get one point six. So when you divide it automatically converts it into a float. And then here again another float. And then like let's say if you use a two um division signs, then it'll do a floor division. So 
it'll just do 5, so instead of doing 5.667, you get 5. You might want to use that if you just want to work with um, integers and not, um, what's it called, um, floats. Or let's say if you're working with like numbers like 15 divided by 3 and you don't want a double, you just want an integer, then you could use this as well. Then you have all, obviously the module, so it's 15 divided by 3, so that's 5 and 2. And then there's 5 times 3 plus 2. So it's kind of straightforward. Then here's a big difference thing. So with two asterisks, so this is not a multiplication sign, this is now to the power. So 5 to the power of 2. That, that's kind of what the double asterisks mean. So I know some languages use this or maybe pow and then you do this like so live in C and I believe MATLAB uses this but in Python we use uh, two asterisks so as you can see here 5 squared is 25 2 to the power of 7 is 128 now here's the thing though so negative 3 to the power of 2 so that should be 9 correct however you get negative 9 so what this is actually reading is oh this is um 3 to the power of 2 and then multiply by negative one. So it's basically it's converting it into a negative number. The I think the main reason for that is just since in Python the way you describe a negative number is negative two. So it just automatically converts anything into a negative. There's no um, separate uh, function for that. So in this case you put negative three here, so now it knows negative three is a negative number, it'll convert just everything in the parentheses, so it's just a three. So in this case, we get 9. In this case, it's reading that. Hopefully this, does that kind of make sense, or does anybody have any questions right there? OK, so then 2 to the power of negative 1. In this case, it kind of automatically just converts this into a negative, since there's nothing after it. And obviously, this would just be 0 0.5, since um, so that's just 1 divided by 2, 0 0.5, and that's the same thing as 1 divided by 2 to the power of 1, so that's just doing an inverse. And then width, so here's a, another thing about um, Python. Python's a very object-oriented language, which means we get one object, we do another thing with another object, and then we put it inside another object. So all this here, all we're just doing is map and just spitting out what we did. But it's not assigning it to anything, so it just kind of ignores it afterwards. Well, actually, it'll save it as a temporary variable, and after that, it'll just delete it. So you can actually do stuff like this, and it won't actually change your code. So it's kind of like more of a calculator function. It is pretty interesting since, like, let's say in C, you just can't do this. You have to always assign stuff to an object. But however, Python is an object-oriented language, and Realistically, in your code, you're going to end up doing stuff like this, assigning stuff to objects. You might just use this just as kind of like a quick check. So, like, let's say for Jupyter Notebook, I want to check real quickly what, I don't know, like, to to the power of 9 is, then you'd use, like, just this. But most of the time, you'll be assigning stuff to an object. Because if you don't, it won't save it. Even for advanced stuff like the data frame, you can do amazing stuff to it, but if you don't assign it to a part of the data frame, it won't save. But I'll get into that later on. So then width here equals 20, height equals 5 times 90, and then so you get 9,000. So that's basically 9 times 5, what's that? 450. Uh, 20 times 250, that's 9,000. So, so like when you assign a variable, what's nice about it, it, it doesn't have to be just a number. Let's say you don't know what 5 times 90 is, and you don't want to do that map, you can just say it's 5 times 90, you know, save it as, a, as an object as so. well. Um, now in this case, like if you haven't assigned a variable, like just n, obviously it will be an error since I haven't assigned anything to that variable. So the only thing you can really write variables for anything is numbers. Like Python will automatically um, notice numbers, and you can notice, like if you notice, um, sorry for repeating myself. Um, so like you see width, height, height. All these are variables and just black, but numbers, if you notice how they're green, that means Python recognizes it as an actual 
object, like, okay, Python knows what 20 is. With, it doesn't know what it is, that's just a text. So until you actually assign it to something, it will know. So essentially, if I just say with, Python doesn't know what with is. If you say with equals 20, then it knows what it is. So, so basically it's saying, a number 20 goes into this object that I will call with, and then Python will know. And then, so in this case, I just said n. Python doesn't know what n is, so error. Okay. So then again, it's just pulling point numbers. Nothing real special right there. So here we have the tax. So like let's say here we calculate the tax. So uh, the price is 150. Tax equals 12. 0.5 divided by 100, so that's 12.5% tax, which is pretty high. And then, so price and tax, so the tax for that will be $12. So price plus this underscore. The underscore just says, okay, like this, la the last variable I did, and then you just add it. So like it will just assign it to a temporary variable. I never ever used this before, honestly, and it's not really useful unless you're just using Python as a glorified calculator, however, uh, uh, it's just good to know. And then you can also round it as well, so like let's say now this is 113, and then like let's say I wanted only two decimal places, so like 113 and 6 cents. So do that, 113 and 6 cents. And round is a needed built um, function in Python, so there's no calling a library, this is just needed built into Python. And you know what right away is, sorry. Yeah, so underscore means always means the last uh, variable or uh, the number that we use, right? Correct, yes. So, like, let's say here price times tax, we didn't actually assign it to an object, so Python assigns it into the underscore. However, that's just a temporary thing. Like, let's say next time I um, I do another calculation, it'll, it'll delete this last one it'll, and it'll put the new one in. So, it's just a temporary variable for the last one. So that's kind of what the underscore is used for. So, so it's always the last unassigned number, right? Exactly. So it won't, let's say, do you price equals 100.5. Uh, like we can even try that if you want. So let's say, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to assign, I don't know, uh, value equals. So, and this should be so. Okay, I see. So, as long as you, um, the last one it will output. So, in this case, it will be 12.56. In this case, it will just be. So, since it couldn't output, since that's another thing. Um, well, at least we're using Jupyter Notebook. It will only output the last uh, line of code. So, like right now, it didn't show since this is the first one. So we literally did nothing with this. But if I were to cut this, it will be 113. Now, if you do value equals, let's say I do that and then value equals 10. Then you'll see here that will still be 115.6. The reason why is since value equals 10, that's just telling you, okay, I'm going to send it to an object. But when you just do, let's say, price plus something, and you're not using, let's say, anything to assign it to an object, it'll just display it and we'll save it to this temporary underscore. That's all it does. But so essentially, that's just uh, kind of a the only reason you use us to check stuff, like let's say, wait, well, what what is the final price? Or it's just kind of a useful debugging method. But once you're actually running code, you won't really use it as much. But yeah, so basically, it's the last thing you'll output. So like let's say here, I did this one first. I mean, sorry, I did this one first and then this one last. So you might think, oh, round, it will round ten. No, since the last output without an equal sign is the one it will do. Does that kind of make sense, or? Okay. And then now we'll get into strings. 
So if you ever came from a C background, which is mostly where I came from, so I'll probably reference that the most. Um, um, so you can do stuff like spam eggs, that's a single quote. And I, if so, like, uh, you might think, oh, um, that should be a char, that's not only for only one character. In Python, basically, um, a single quote and true quotes are the same thing. Like, there might be a slight difference, but re reality, I've used both of them before, and they're basically the same. They're, you can use one with, like, or the other, just really preference. I, uh, since I came from a C background, don't really like this format too much. I prefer using double quotes when it's like a longer statement. However, Python itself spits stuff out with just a uh, single quote. So, again, that's just personal preference. Um, like, let's say here, doesn't. So, obviously, this would be kind of an awkward thing to do if you... Since, basically, the char will be from here to here, right? But wait. What if I write something like doesn't? You have a contraction, and now you have this awkward, like, so if you were not to include this backslash, you would just see, it would just read, okay, doesn't, and then this T, like, it'll stop here, and then, like, wait. Like, so there's this T, and you only had one chart, so it'll spit on out an error. So, like, it, well, let me show you. So, I mean, it's just, I mean, spam makes that works out. And if you notice how Python spits out stuff in single quotes, then we have doesn't, and the way it is right now, obviously it'll just spit out doesn't. But let's say I were to take this black slash. Look what happens. Invalid syntax, because it reads right now like okay, this is the this the um, this is the string, and then it just sees this t and this random um quote. So this thing will see like this thing is missing a quote. That's what it's reading. So that's why you have to add this backslash. So that way you can understand what's going on. Or if you're, or if that seems really complicated, and I really, I honestly don't like this method. You can just use double quotes if you're going to use a contraction, and it does the same thing. So I believe this method is just a lot easier. Then, like you can use like a single quote if you're going to use double quotes. So let's say if you want to spell yes, he said, then. And it's probably easier just to use single quotes outside. And this is a uh, side note. So right now we're just doing it um, like this. Uh, so it's, it's just spinning out literally the text literal. However, when you're actually interfacing with this, the only thing that will come out is the stuff in between the quotes. So I can't even show you right now. So I do print. So print is how you print stuff to. Um, that's probably a bad explanation. Um, Print is how you output stuff to any. So, you notice how those those um, quotes here were eliminated? Since basically, this just tells you where the string starts and the string ends. So, like, let's say you put this into like, a title, it's just going to read this. It's not going to read those single quotes. Okay, so. Then again, yes, he said in different ways. I'm just gonna actually skip this part. It's just kind of long. And I think yeah, I can explain. Okay, so let me get into here. Backslash and this is important. So again, so this is like this here just literally saying what Python has, like as a text. And when you print it, this is what it'll print. See this backslash n? So that just means new line. So if you notice your first line, second line, right there. So essentially, if you were to print this out in some um, some program or some title, it'll know, OK, we're going to create a new line. And here's where this is very important. So when you're working with um, Python, you will eventually need to import files from your computer. So let's say you use a C drive. Windows uses backslashes. So you can see what happens right here. You see how now your your file name is cut. So if if you ever used Python before and you imported a file, you know that you can just just put your C drive file name like this. 
it will break it, you, ha you have to put the R in front. The reason for that, since that will just say, okay, this is like the string literal, like literally just get everything from this string and put it that way, like uh, like ignore backslash and ignore like other um, formats. So in this case, it's C slash something. And um, Linux, we use forward slashes, so we don't really use R's when you, you know import file names. But if you're using Windows, and like I don't get in this into this next lecture, always always put an R in front. It'll it'll save multiple headaches for you. Um, and then this just here, like if you want to, you can use three lines like here, like three string, like sorry, three double quotes or three single quotes and those are, are just like, okay, just print everything here so essentially if you don't want to just do a single line and you want to use multiple lines, you use the triple and you can use a backslash here if you just want to li eliminate do you see this white space right here? yeah, it's eliminated right there so, not much of a... then same thing here You can use this, but realistically, everybody just kind of uses uh, number signs for all, for multiple lines. I mean, that's what I've done, and they're, that's what you're saying right here. Um, okay, so here's the fun part about strings, concatenating string, strings. So essentially, you can get multiple strings and combine them together. And that's very useful for when you create titles. Like, you can get the name of something, and the dates of something, and you can get... I don't know, like, like say some specific words you want to insert and you can actually combine those and make a sentence automatically and that's very useful when you're working with multiple plots so like 3 times un plus em so that will, what this will read is 3 times un so there will be un 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 plus em so you'll see right here and I believe this is some unnamed predicted periodic element but I could be wrong however that's not relevant to this course but as you see here I just repeated three uns and then like let's say if you have two strings together like this you will kind of know okay just put those two together so python but however like let's say if you assign a string to an object like let's say right here now it's prefix and in thong it will know since it this phrase is just another object so it will create an error and this also creates an error since we're just kind of creating a function right here while well, actually putting parentheses. However, this is the very useful part. Like you see here, like you can, you it's kind of a weird concept at first, but you can add. So essentially, the way you concatenate realistically is you you're adding all the objects together. So you kind of assign each string to an object. So or you might automatically generate those, and you can add them together to create like a sentence. This might seem like superfluous right now. However, we get into uh, into pandas, you'll be amazed at what you can do with this. So, yeah. And then just here, like if you put them all into like the same parentheses, you can combine them. Okay, so here's another fun one part about Python, indexing, and this is super important, so so I assigned the object here, war equals Python and also, just as a side note, Python starts arrays, lists, etc. with zero so you always count from zero to what uh, to whatever, whatever the last number is in Python um, I believe most, if you came from a C background, you probably used to that if you're coming from a MATLAB background, I believe MATLAB starts with a one and not with a zero so that's just kind of a heads up right there. Um, so like say word zero, P, and then like zero, one, two, three, four, five. So this should be N. And you see here N. And here's another very cool thing about Python. So like, like let's say you have a really long word or like an array or whatever. whatever. I want to go to the last character. You don't have to actually know like how long, like the length of the character. Like let's say you have a word that's I don't know 16 letters long. You don't have to think. You don't have to actually go and count like okay one zero one two three uh, all the way to 16. Like, okay, I'm gonna call it at 16. You can just put negative one like this, and it will know okay that's the last number. 
And if you do negative 2, that's the second to last number. And if you do negative 6, that's the sixth to last number, which in this case is the first number. And then you can also use a colon for start to end. So words like 0 to 2, so that's basically get everything from 0 to 2. However, if you see here, it's just two numbers. It always excludes the last, and you'll see that as well in um, for loops, which we'll get in, in a bit. So it's 0 to 2, but it'll exclude 2. Python always usually starts with the first one and excludes the last one. And there's like a reason for that, but I'll explain that in the for loops. So then again, to the 5, so this is like so, let's say zero, PY, so that's 0, 1, and 2. So that's right here. 2, 3, 4. Done. And like, let's say if you want to go from 0 to 2, you can just be lazy and just do pi or 4 to 0. So basically, it's 4 to the last number. And then negative 2 to 0. So you just kind of go backwards. And this will just create iPhone. Python. So yeah, if you do this and then the other one, these are just kind of the inverse, so they equal to the same thing. So it's just basically the same thing as negative one plus one. And then it's just kind of a visual representation of Python. However, this will create an error right here since 4 to 42, we don't have anything in our index that's 42. However, Python is a little bit smart in the sense that, like, oh, go to 4 to 42, we'll just say, okay, um, the length of this array is up to, I believe, 6, in this case, no, 5. So I'll just ignore everything from 6 to 42, and I'll just do, like, the on. However, when it's just 42, then it just can't find anything, and you just can't ignore it, so there'll, there'll be an error. And here it doesn't see anything, so I'll we'll just spit that out. And you can actually change the actual array. As you see here. But that's not a big problem. Since, like I said, you can actually, what to call it, let's say, word 1 plus j. So now you have Jython, right? So essentially you can get that, like you can uh, create something from that object, you can get another object, and you just assign it to a new object. So now you have Jython. So yeah, that, that's just the uh, solution. In this case you get PyPy, so essentially we got another part of it, so you got Pi, and then, that, and then Pi, and then you get PyPy. But if you try to combine the two, obviously it won't work. You really will never use the two string literals connected. You have to add them almost all the time. And then this is one of my favorite um, functions in Python, the length. You'll have no idea if all this will be useful in the future, especially when you're iterating through for loops. And then, so like in this case, it's 34. So here's the thing though. If you were to count this, it'll be 0 to 33. There is no... If you actually... I'll show you right now. You see there? There's an error. When we subtract 1, 33, we get this S. Why? Because this is 0 to 33. But if you count it, it's 34. Does that kind of make sense, or is this part a little confusing? Okay, so then lists. Lists are just kind of another way of saying vectors if you're coming from a C background. So squares equals 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. And then again, so like, like the arrays, squares 0, did I? Right. 
Oh, I see what I did wrong. I forgot two. I drew this one first. Then square zero, then you get one. So I just forgot two. I drew that one. My bad. So yeah, square zero, so you get one. Let's say you. And then this is where negative one, you get 25. This is even more useful than it is in arrays. So, like, sometimes you have an array that can be even, I don't know, 95,000 um, point of different uh, values inside that same array. So, obviously, nobody's going to actually count that. So, if you do negative one, now you know which one's your last one. So, that's very useful. And then you can do slicing as well. And then. Yeah, so this is just kind of a superfluous way of saying squares, and then negative three. So you just go from the um, from negative three, and then all the way to zero. So like go from three to the last one. That's what all it really says. So it's this what so it's just like get the last three values. That's what this says versus let's say zero to three. Get the first three values. That's the difference. Then we get squares plus 36, 49, 81. So essentially what we're doing here is we create another list and we're adding it to this list and you can combine those two. So in this case, you can actually combine all those squares. Like in the list you couldn't do that. Um, however, like I mentioned, if I didn't I would do squares again, Notice how it didn't change it. Squares. Because we just did something like we only thing we did is get two objects and combine them. But we didn't actually assign that to the object again. If you want this to work, we do this. You have to be specific where like so basically you get the object and you reassign it again. And then you get squares. There you go. Now you reassigned it. Oh wait, what did I? Where do I need? Okay, I see what happened. Since so, what happened right there? If you notice, at first it repeated itself. What I did wrong was. I did squares, then this I I did a typo, and so it didn't output this um, list, but it did already do this function. So essentially, Python goes line by line. So even though you get an error, you would think, okay, nothing executed, it, it executed the first line. So when I fixed this and I ran it again, it already created this um, square for me, and then it redefined it. So if I, I believe I do this again, you see, and it re, you know, added it again. So that's what uh, happened the first time. So that's just kind of a good side note. So like here, like again, we just redefined this like cubes one a twenty seven sixty five. So uh, so this is just human defined. The computer didn't actually calculate these cubes. Um. So obviously here, you know, this is should be sixty four. So if you see something like this, okay, uh, then in this case, cubes 3 equals 64, and you can fix it. If you notice though, you're, you're assigning 64 to a part of the object. So what you're saying here is, um, instead of saying cubes equals 64, which in, in case it will just delete the array or list and assign it to 64, in this case it would say, okay, go to cube 3 and whatever it's there, reassign it to this value and you can do that. So that's kind of the thing with Python, so like if you have to always make sure that like you're assigning stuff to objects. That's like a very important part. And then just append is just kind of like I believe push from like C. So cubes dot append 216 and then 7 to the 3. So if you see here we just added the cubes for I believe 6 and 7. And then here, give me a second. 
we have A, B, C, D, so then you can replace these with capitals. They can, like, so all it's saying here, you can do it not only with just one part, but you can, like, so here, change from 2 to the 5 to C, D, E. And then you can even delete those if you want to. And then, yeah, you can clear the list by just doing this. Or honestly, you can don't even have to do that. You can just do letters and just equals an empty list, and it would also work as well. So as long as you assign, once you do the equal sign, and you assign it to anything else, it will delete whatever it had before, and will put in your new um, assignment. And then letters equals A, B, C, D, and then again, you can get the length of that. Four. But if you notice, this will be 0, 1, 2, 3. And then you can do a list within a list. So if you see here, there's a list. So you have a list of lists. And that may be a little bit weird, but when you do 2D arrays, that becomes matrices in NumPy. And it's similar to this, so this is an important concept to understand. So if you say you do x0, you're going to get the first image, ABC. And then let's say you want to get, I don't know, like A. So you know it's in the first list, and in that list, it's in the, sorry, in this case you need B. So in this, uh, you want to get B. So you know it's in the first list, but you want to get the second um, value from that list. So 0, 1. So then if I change it to, like let's say, 1, 1, you're, we're going to get 2 right here. And then this kind of the stuff. That's everything I got from that le lecture. And then now we can do stuff like, let's say, an if statement. So an if statement is just like if x is less than 0, x equals 0. The important part here is to always include these colons, because then it'll create the index in the next one. And, it'll, and it needs that to understand what will be inside this if statement. So that's this kind of like the brackets in C. So x equals 0, and then like it will print this. Elif, so elif is just else if in uh, Python. So like, okay, so if x is less than 0, make it 0. If x is equal to 0, then print 0. If x equals equals 1, make it, then print single. If it's more than that, then just print more. So in this case, I'm going to do this. So if it's say, I don't know, 25, then I run here. It's more, right? No, let's say I enter negative 6. Negative change to 0. If I change this to, let's say, 0. It's 0. And then, I guess one last example. If I change to 1, it goes single. I notice it's 107. Is everybody good on time? Uh, how much is left? Uh, probably going to be going to get to functions and um, arrays. So that's about 20, 30 minutes more, but that's very important. If you guys don't have time right now, I'll just stop now. We can continue later on. Yeah, I think it would be better if we uh, do that the next, the next class. Ne next class? Okay. Yeah. yeah, it would be better for me. I don't know for the others. So. Uh, how does uh, everybody else feel? Um, it would be a, if, if we could, um, you know, use it, that would be the uh, ideal. Sorry, uh, could you repeat that again? I, I couldn't hear you. Um, you no, know, what I was saying was if we could uh, continue on Thursday, that would be ideal. Okay, yeah, because I think, uh, yeah, this will be a lot more interesting than this first lecture. Like, this week is a little bit boring because it's just kind of repetitive, um, basic material. Then we'll get more to pens, but. I believe we should probably start next week. I mean, sorry, next on Thursday. Okay, so it's a good review, though. So I appreciate it. Yeah, and if you um fill out went too fast or slow, if you want to go into something, you can uh, feel free to go on GitHub, and you can look at the lecture yourself and download it if you want to use it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we'll stop here. Um. Thanks. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, okay. Right. How did I say? Okay. Right.